Hello, um, welcome to this interview webinar. I'm Francis Healy from Enfield Voices and Globalnet 21. And as many of you know, we do a number of these interviews of people who are in our local community or even globally sometimes who are making a difference. And one of the things we have been doing, apart from interviewing a lot of people in civil society, is we've been interviewing some councillors. We've interviewed the leader of Enfield Council, the leader of the opposition. We've interviewed some ex-councillors and we've got some other interviews coming up as well. And today we're intervie interviewing James Hockney. The reason why we're interviewing James is that he recently won a by-election. So he's a fairly new councillor in Enfield, though he was in Cambridgeshire before that or in Cambridge anyhow. So he has some experience. So we wanted to talk to him about what it is like being a new councillor, how you focus your ideas and your interests and how you think you can get those achieved. So we're going to start talking to James now, but let me say first of all, this is after last night's vote in the House of Commons, <laughs> a hell of a time to do an interview. Who would want to go into politics? But clearly, James, you have decided you want to, you know, tread the, the, the hot calls and go into politics. So maybe you could tell us, first of all, a little about yourself and your background. Um, so absolutely. I was originally uh, born in uh, Ely in Cambridgeshire. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I was a councillor there between 2004-2016. Um, one of the things I actually did there was a, a shop local scheme to support local small businesses. Uh, I got to know the owners of the local Indian restaurant quite well. And um, they wanted to more part of the community and I said well let's do a charity do so we did uh, a charity do for one of the um, charities I'm involved with uh, Red Balloon who help cover bullied school children um, and their daughter London um, hadn't been up to the restaurant but came up to the charity do and uh, eight years on uh, we're very happily married and uh, have a wonderful uh, daughter and then made the uh, decision to uh, move to uh, to Enfield uh, so, uh, into retirement as a councillor in 2016 when we moved here, uh, and then very unexpectedly, uh, obviously heard about the, uh, the by-election, obviously I'm now a councillor in Enfield, but uh, my wife is originally uh, from uh, Bangladesh, uh, so I get uh, many great, uh, 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 my mother-in-law does me a lot of uh, great food, um, as I did a uh, law degree. Uh, in 2012, I took the uh, decision to uh, to go back to uh, to college, so that was a, a big step for me. But certainly, having a law degree behind me, I think, will help me in terms of being a council, understanding legislation, and, and advocating uh, for local residents and uh, run my own small business from home. So it means that I've got the time and flexibility to be a councillor, and obviously bringing up a young family here, living in Bushel. I'm obviously quite passionate uh, about the future. Yeah, you, you mentioned some of your interests there, which, you know, uh, you know, were interesting in themselves. I mean, one of the things I noticed that when you were in Cambridgeshire, you were interested in bullying in school and an anti-bullying policy. What made you concerned about that and what did you do about it or what can you do about it? Uh, well, I was actually uh, bullied at school, so that, that's where I came from, the, the vantage point of having uh, an interest in, um, in the issue. And uh, in Cambridge, we've got the Red Balloon uh, Children's Charity. They've got uh, a number of learner centres, including one in Harrow, that help recover uh, bullied school children. Um, they help uh, children on the most serious end where um, they're actually school phobic because they've been so badly bullied. A lot of them have uh, self-harm. So a big part of what the, the charity does is um, firstly, um, uh, very small class sizes, only uh, one teacher to one or two children to get them caught up with education because quite a lot of them have, it's a very substantial amount of school, maybe haven't been to school for uh, for a year or two. And then the other side is the, the emotional recovery. So because of the psychological issues that they face. So um, the charity helps them recover uh, and then place them back into, if appropriate, mainstream education 
um, with a school that has a very strong um, anti-bullying policy. So I've been involved with the, the charity for 10 years ago. I met the, had a meeting with the chief executive when I was a counsellor and you know, I was looking to see what I could do to support them. And after the first meeting, she invited me to, uh, to be a trustee. Um, and then I progressed on to doing the voluntary role of political liaison officer where I, I speak to different uh, MPs and, and ministers um, on behalf of the charity um, on a voluntary basis to, to raise the, um, the issue. I mean, the, there is a real social justice issue here and it's been under both governments that we've got at least uh, 16,000 children outside of um, education because they've been so badly bullied. And, you know, where is the uh, provision, um, the, the alternative uh, provision um, is not uh, consistent across all of the country. Um, quite often the alternative provision is uh, what they call pupil referral units, is, which is quite often where uh, the excluded uh, bully goes to. Where, so it's worst possible scenario of a uh, bully child going to a place where there could be uh, school bullies. So. Um, I've been uh, writing on Conservative Home and, and other blog sites uh, about the issue. I've come up with a, a charter um, to be uh, to, to try and address the issue and flag the, the issues. Um, um, as part of my research, um, I've also discovered um, a wider issue um, of uh, school exclusions. Um, one, for instance, is children with uh, SEN needs are six times more likely to be excluded on a temporary or permanent basis um, rather than the, the rest of the population. So, um, again, I, I've written recently for the site Conservative Home uh, raising those uh, issues, and also you can see them on my website and also the article in more detail. Um, on that's, I mean, that's quite, that's quite interesting because last night we did a webinar interview with Barbara Ball, who works for ASEND, and we it was a totally on exclusions. And clearly, children who were bullied uh, were often excluded, and how you get them back into mainstream is quite interesting. I mean, Hannah Dyson was wondering what you thought about education in the Bushfield Park area, whether you've experienced some of the same problems you've talked about now there as well. So um, I've got a young daughter, so we're looking at uh, educational provision. Um, I haven't encountered uh, the issues that you've uh, mentioned, but. One, one of the challenges that we find is because it's roughly 16,000 children, uh, if you spread that across the constituencies across the country, it means that um, MPs might be getting one or two letters about it. Um, so it's sort of, it's not, it's too high a number for a charity like Red Balloon and charities to, to address. It's on the lower end of the numbers where there'd be a, a national outrage about it. And when you think there's at least 16,000 children that are not attending school. So, and the issue with alternative provision is there's uh, very little monitoring of it. Uh, there isn't a set uh, path and a scheme to it. Um, but also the, uh, the children that are excluded there isn't often a, a pathway back for them into mainstream education and once they're excluded the the school uh, typically um, stops um, most of them actually stop monitoring um, and the the other iniquity is that by the Ofsted uh, system if they're good or outstanding there's a lot of schools that haven't been inspected for a very significant amount of years um, and that means that they feel that they can do unofficial you know exclusions because the, the accountability um, isn't there. There is a body that um, parents, if they feel the child's been unfairly excluded, can appeal to, uh, but that I can't actually overrule uh, and reinstate the school child. There's, there's another problem in Enfield, which is becoming of increasing concern to people, particularly around Enfield Grammar School, and that's the fact that people are being mugged and they're being patted over to see if they've got mobiles or money or whatever. And, and, and that's becoming a, a real problem for many people and if, if you have watched the you know um secret witness program last night it was based upon that the number the fact that drug dealers go into schools and you've got a real problem there what can a counselor do to help with that situation because a lot of people are saying you know this is awful i'm really worried about my children what can i do now do you feel fairly helpless in that situation or do you think you can play a significant role in tackling that problem well, certainly what I'd say is, uh, as a 
a counsellor and I'd say to anyone that, that's watching, if they've got um, those concerns or they've seen those experiences, by all means, um, do um, obviously firstly make sure that the, uh, the school and the police are aware of the issue, but do um, obviously contact your local counsellor um, and do flag it up so they can obviously take up the issue. Uh, and obviously uh, part of a counsellor's role is obviously to speak directly to the council, but also to, to raise issues and concerns um, in debates in the uh, in the council. There was a very, uh, and so there was a very interesting uh, debate in November about uh, policing um, you know, and policing numbers. So. Um, if you've got any concerns, uh, by all means, always reach out to your counsellor, you know, because at the end of the day, we are public servants, um, you know, and we are there to help. And if there's an issue that we can't help on, then we're there to obviously point you in the right direction uh, so you can get the issue resolved. So one, I think one of the problems people have with counsellors, not, not just with counsellors, with lots of us, is that, you know, you say here's a problem and they say, oh, it's somebody else's problem. It's the mayor. He hasn't put enough money in it. No, it's the government. They haven't put enough money into it. And so they're, putting the, they're, they're playing the blame game, whereas what people want to know is how can you personally help? What can you do? Don't blame someone else. Let's see what we can do together. I mean, do you feel that really we've got to actually get people to have a responsibility to try and do something through their counsellor? Yes, and uh, my time as a, a counsellor in, in Cambridgeshire, uh, there was uh, a couple of uh, different issues where, uh, <laughs> as you mentioned, um, there are multiple stakeholders um, involved. And um, in two specific instances, um, I had to get um, all the key stakeholders um, around the table. One um, was uh, back in Cambridgeshire, the local army barracks closed and uh, there was a lot of empty units. They were being burgled. Um, there was also uh, some of the local community was still living there. So it was quite a scary time. And it was just getting pushed around. So I had to get um, MOD and the people that were taking over the, the, hope, the properties, uh, the local residence group and other councillors, um, the MP's office and different police, different people around the table also had an issue where um, uh, people were, the sewage system wasn't working properly and people were having sewage backing up into the property and there was again multiple stakeholders because you had the, the council environmental agency and the water company and a number of other stakeholders uh, and in both instances um, getting people around the, the table um, we actually managed to get uh, both issues um, actually resolved and you know, as a you know as a councillor you should be able to show the leadership of getting that um, that resolution. There are other issues where, um, for instance, uh, we've got the, the issue of um, in Bushnell Park and in Enfield and Edmonton of speeding uh, along the the A10, uh, and that does sit with TfL, which is within the uh, the mayor's office. So uh, the BBC actually did a an interview with me on television on January 2nd to, to highlight the issue and I'm very much pressing that I'm going to be asking a, a question at um, submit a question for uh, for council at the end of the month which will be my first formal council meeting. Okay so you've got that to look forward to. I noticed that also when you were on Cambridge you were very interested in the environment and conservation and you were involved in developing a green infrastructure and biodiversity strategy. Now do you want to tell us what that is and whether we've got one in Enfield that you think is fit for purpose and what we could do? Um, not in a short, <laughs> short space of uh, time, but we'll, we'll know, make it short because I want to ask some more questions. <laughs> but you know, one one thing that um, you know I will specifically highlight is obviously I've come from uh, you know rural Cambridgeshire and uh, coming into Enfield. This is my home. This is where I'm going to bring up my uh, family, and I love living here. Um, and in Cambridgeshire, they've got green belt. But in Enfield, we've got green belt. But I think green, you know, the green belt is even more important in, in Enfield because of the pollution that uh, we have. And the Conservative group and myself are very clear um, that we must protect um, our local green belt um, at all costs. We cannot be building on uh, our green belt. We really must be looking at um, all brownfield sites um, as best we can. Um, in, in terms of being, uh, as you I rightly so in terms of being passionate about the, uh, the environment. I was delighted uh, last week to attend a meeting with my fellow councillor Claire De Silva with the uh, the First Park Wetlands uh, Friends Group and uh, to see what their 
are doing uh, and it's just amazing that some green fields have been turned into a wetland and they've got some very exciting plans for the future and you know I think it just shows that it's you know there are so many great volunteers and charities that we've got um, in the area and that's making a fantastic difference to the environment but it also is great for people that want to, to get out and be active um, and they're putting on different community activities so um, I'm so delighted to be you know elected to to Bristol Park and and, and the bar because we've got so many great things um, that, that are going on and I, I want to play my part in in supporting uh, projects and schemes that like that uh, help protect our environment for our future generations. Well we've, we've got an interview uh, scheduled with Bob Liddell who actually is involved in the wetlands project in Wichmore Hill and we're sort of looking forward to that. Um, now obviously you were elected in a by-election in Wichmore yes. Hill and, and in Bushill Park sorry and you've got a quite, a, quite a big majority there. Hannah wants to know have you got any plans specifically for the Bushill Park area? Have you got a strategy for that? What's your aims and objectives there? Okay. Well, I, well, firstly, could I just say um, how grateful I am um, that uh, the people in Bushell Park um, place their, their faith um, in me. Obviously, I moved into the area in you know, a relatively recent time period and the great scheme of uh, things. And um, you know, I went into the, uh, I felt the call to return to uh, public service after enjoying a little bit of a retirement. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's always been very close between Labour and Conservatives in, in, in recent elections and, you know, under 100 majority. And we managed to secure an over you know, 700 majority. So I was um, quite shocked by the results. I was telling everyone how close it was going to be, but I'm deeply humbled that people have um, uh, placed the faith in it. So I just want to say a, a quick thank you. I stood on the platform of three key issues. Um, one was to protect our weekly uh, bin collection and oppose uh, charging on the green bins, which the, the council is uh, consulting on. I have a young family, I know how quickly our, our blue bin uh, you know, fills up, so I'm going to be fighting to protect that. Um, also campaigned on school road safety around the, uh, the Raglan School. And I was delighted that uh, myself and Council Claire Silva have been pushing very hard to see the crossing installed and delighted that that is there now. Uh, but it doesn't stop there um, because uh, there's three ways into, three entrances into school. So we'll see a 20 mile per hour speed limit um, uh, around the school. So we've achieved one thing, but it doesn't stop there. We're on to the, uh, the next thing and I'm going to be using the previous campaign experience and successes I've had um, back in Cambridgeshire to, to further uh, that success. Um, and the other one uh, is uh, the A10 speeding. You know, we're having people speeding down there. It's causing a lot of noise. It's causing a lot of pollution. Real road safety issue. We've obviously had some very serious um, accidents. And it doesn't just um, impact people that are living uh, along the A10 in Bushell Park. It's all, all the way through Edmonton and then fills along the A10. And, and further for a field, I've spoken to so many people that uh, hear the noise from, from very far um, away. So I'm pushing very hard to get those, those speed camera, extra speed cameras in place. So those were the th three key issues that, uh, that I stood on. But being a councillor, it's advocating for your community um, in the council chamber, taking up casework. I've already, one of the things as a councillor is you are elected straight away and on the Saturday I had my first piece of casework. So you've got to be able to hit the ground running and be dealing with, with issues straight away. Some of them are minor end, but some of them are, are very serious. So you've got to be you know, able to be there and, and helping people um, in my previous time. So uh, how, do you, how do you plan to do that? I mean, how do you plan to keep in touch with your, your ward uh, electorate? Uh, is it through ward forums? Is it surgeries? How do you plan to have that connection? Well, we've already, I've already had uh, my first uh, ward uh, surgery before Christmas uh, with uh, Cats Claire Silver. We've got uh, another one on Friday. Uh, we've got a fantastic um, residence uh, association that um, are very active. I was actually uh, a member uh, before I actually stood. So I saw firsthand the, the great work um, that they've been doing and they do community litter picks. They 
advocate and press on key issues. So um, they have regular committee meetings. So I'll be uh, attending attending those. So I obviously use local shops very actively, but um, you know, just because my election's over, activity doesn't uh, stop. So it's doing all those things. I've obviously been in the media advocating for the community, but it's it have to be committed to be doing it um, properly. The electorate soon picks up on somebody that's not doing their job. How, how do you do it in innovative ways though? Because residents associations are great, but they tend to be older people. Uh, ward forums are great to some extent, but they tend to be the usual suspects. How do you reach out beyond that to the people who don't normally engage? Have you thought about the use of social media like you're doing now or other means of doing that? Yeah, the the amazing thing was um, I, we did um, three campaign videos on the three key issues. I mentioned the bins, the ATEM and the school road safety around the, the Raglan school. And it was uh, amazing the, the amount of people that, that were viewing it. The, the bins video, I believe, uh, thousands of people in Bristol Park viewed it. Uh, and the other uh, videos, there was a very significant amount of uh, people viewing that. And I think, as you, you quite rightly say, you've got to you've got to move, um, you know, with the times and, you know, there is a lot more people on, on social media and that, that is an important tool. So I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, so I'm, I am actively using that. In addition to the traditional methods of, you know, going uh, door knocking, I think I lost over a stone during the by election campaign there. Uh, so uh, a lot of people saw me uh, that way, you know, putting out the leaflet. So it, I think it's, you know, uh, and also I've been obviously in the, I'm obviously speaking to yourself today and I've been on the uh, on the BBC on, on January 2nd. So I think it's all of the above you need to be doing to be a strong um, and effective uh, councillor. And, you know, but for me, this is, uh, you know, a step up. I was originally representing uh, a community that uh, was about three and a half thousand, so over 10,000 people in uh, Bushell Park. Um, we had uh, Cambridgeshire three tiers of um, local government, parish, district and county. Um, here we have a borough council. So it's, um, it's very much, uh, for me, it's a step, step up. And, you know, you always are, as a council or any servant in a public capacity, you, you always need to be, be learning, um, upskilling. So I'm looking forward to uh, the challenge and the, the, uh, the months and, and uh, years ahead. So you're in the tradition of President Obama, Chairman Corbyn and so on, and you're using social media the right way and, and, and reaching those people and videos is clearly an important way of doing that. What about council meetings? You haven't attended a council meeting yet because there hasn't been one since you were elected, which yes. is very strange. Two months you can't even go on a committee until that council meeting takes place. It yes. seems a bit weird. You think they have a different system for that. Do you think councils, the way they run, the way they hold council meetings, the way they hold committees is up to date or is it not fit for purpose? I mean, very often so much time is wasted on debating national issues rather than discussing together what people can do locally, what positive new ideas they've got. Do you think we need to rethink how we organize our councils? For me, uh, you know, I'm a, a public service at a uh, public servant at a, a local level and there was obviously national issues coming up uh, during the, the by-election campaign and I was more than happy to talk to people about the, the issues that they were raising with me but I was always very clear that you know as a local council it's about dealing with uh, and actioning uh, local issues so that's that's where the focus is and that's where my focus is going to be in the council chamber to be advocating for my community and seeing that Enfield Council is providing the best deal. Um, no, no, um, no form of democracy is perfect, but it's the best thing that, that we've got. And councils do provide, you know, the opportunity for democratic oversight, where obviously residents can attend meetings and see everything that, that's going on. So um, I, I wouldn't suggest, uh, you know, changing that uh, per se. But I think that obviously councillors have a role to make sure that they're being as relevant as possible to uh, the people that uh, elect them and that they are in touch with uh, the needs and aspirations of the local community. But you wouldn't, for example, think of doing things that some people are beginning of thinking of things about doing now, and that's having citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, local ones, where you involve civil society a lot more in the decision making, or as one council has done, they have devolved to wards, uh, forums, 
budget responsibilities for their local area. There are lots of ways of devolving. Have you thought about some of those yes, things that I do? Yeah, and there's been um, quite a few councils, as you quite rightly say, that have devolved some of their budget to councillors. Uh, and I think that that's you know, a great idea because it helps empower councillors. It brings them closer to the community. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're in the community and they can see acutely some of the, the, the key needs. So I think I'm always open to ideas and has been, uh, is being, as you say, being done at a number of um, you know, councils. And um, I think that, that that is certainly a possibility to, uh, to be uh, looked at as I, as I get up to speed with uh, how um, Anfield Council uh, operates. Well, when you're up to speed, it'd be great if you do look at some of those things because, Absolutely. Um, you know, if we can break down the sort of just rigid party system of doing it. I mean, you're in a party, I understand that, and people are in political parties, but involving civil society, only 2% of the population are in political parties. So involving beyond that is really, really quite important. Yes, I know. No, I agree. And I, I think that's where, you know, the surgeries, the, the war forums, where you're in the community discussing uh, the key issues where, you know, being you know actively involved. I've mentioned about the Wetlands Charity and the, the Residents Association, you know, working with them and bringing it down into you know, the community is, I, I agree, absolutely key. OK, I mean, we're getting very close to the end. Let me ask you a couple. OK, so, I know, no, yeah, it's, it's going I've, been, I've been talking too much. Uh, well, you're a politician, you're allowed to. <laughs> my, it's my job to stop you. Um, okay. You know, um, I did, you, let's look at other interests. I mean, A, do you have any ambitions to go into Parliament? I gather you stood for Parliament. And do you have any other interests outside of politics, what Dennis Healy once called your hinterland, which is important. I gather, for example, you're very interested in astronomy and you've worked with Patrick Moore at one point. So maybe tell us about your parliamentary ambitions and your outside interests. So I've obviously just been uh, elected to um, uh, the uh, part by election. I'm absolutely committed uh, to, to doing that. You know, who knows what um, is going to um, come in the future, but I'm bringing up a, a young family um, at the moment. I've been elected, I've been a council for the next three and a half years, and you know, that is my, my absolute uh, focus. Obviously, I've been very flattered that uh, quite a lot of people see me as a potential MP or want to see me as a, an MP, but um, I want to serve out. I'm very focused on doing this first term and going beyond. Um, I'm still young enough if I want to take a step up. But uh, my focus um, for the coming years is bringing up my young family and serving as uh, residents of Central Park. Who knows what will be happening in, in 10, 15. And, uh, and you're a politician that likes to look at the stars, yeah? Yeah, so I was, uh, I was uh, an astronomer since um, I was in short trousers, um, I guess when I was about uh, seven, and uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, do some work uh, experience for a publisher that was publishing uh, an astronomy magazine, and then they, they took me on and uh, employed me in a, um, as an advertiser salesman capacity, uh, but I actually ended up also writing, my interest actually ended up writing uh, some articles for the uh, the astronomy magazine and uh, to meet uh, Sir Patrick Moore was uh, was an amazing experience. I've grown up seeing him on on their television and he was a lovely person. One of the things we did as astronomy magazine is we did the London Astronomy Show. Uh, so we had uh, a major annual event um, where we had different venues where we had thousands of people attending over 100 stands uh, and talks um, and I was manning the uh, the book stand and what Sir Patrick Moore did uh, was he heard that of my genuine interest in astronomy it wasn't just working for the magazine that genuine interest he actually bought two of his own books for me and signed them um, and I've never told that story before but um, he was a, a, a wonderful person as well as doing so much to, to further the interests of, of people that were looking to go into astronomy uh, and science uh, and innovation. So greatly uh, enjoyed that. Um, 
Um, I love being involved with the, uh, the Bangladeshi uh, community. Um, I've visited uh, Ponzen Mosque uh, you know, a number of times and it certainly broadened my, my horizon. So I'm delighted that the leader of the opposition, uh, Joe Laban, the le leader of the Conservative Group, has invited me to um, go on to the, the Racial Equality Council. Obviously, that's got to be ratified by uh, full council and I'm really looking forward to, do, uh, to doing that. And I will keep advocating as I have done for the past decade for uh, bullied school children uh, and those that are being excluded from the mainstream education system. Okay and finally very briefly if people want to get in touch with you, need your advice, need you to campaign for something, how do they get in touch with you, what do they do? Um, I'm on uh, uh, Twitter James Hockney LLB, uh, obviously on Facebook um, Enfield Council has got, if you Google, it's got my profile, it's got all my contact details, and it's got all my contact details on my website, uh, jameshockney.com. Uh, so um, everyone is more than welcome to be in touch. I look forward to hearing from everyone. I'm really excited uh, about uh, serving the Community of Bristol Park next three and a half years, and uh, also holding the Labour Council to account on the uh, when they're failing. Um, but um, I have reached across the aisle in previous years. You know, I will praise them when they're doing things right. I will also be holding them to, to account on the many issues that I raise on the campaign trail. Okay, you, you saved the party political bit right till the end. <laughs> but you got it in. I couldn't uh, help it. No, you, you couldn't help it. I know <laughs> politicians can't. But anyhow, I mean, that's been, re that, I mean, that's been really interesting because we, for most of the time, we didn't talk about party politics. We talked about your interests. We talked about issues. We talked about how the council could be more accessible to the community. And those are really important things which grow, up, grow, grow across parties. So thank you for taking part in this. And I'm sure... Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, I'm pleased. To, I hope this will be the first of uh, you know many interviews with councillors, and we find out what they individually want, not what their party wants, but what they individually are interested in. Absolutely. So, thank, thank you for doing it, and uh, you know, this will go up on YouTube as well, and we'll, oh, wow. uh, and we'll end this interview now.